Welcome back to our podcast, The Research Behind Lift the Lid, where we talk to Australian Rotary Health funded researchers in the mental health field about their research findings. I'm Jessica Cooper, and today on episode four, I will be talking to Dr. Philip Batterham from the Australian National University. Dr. Batterham was awarded an Australian Rotary Health Mental Health Research Grant in 2015 to conduct a randomized control- controlled trial testing the effectiveness of a fully tailored adaptive intervention in reducing mental health symptoms among young people. Dr. Batterham is a professor at the Centre for Mental Health Research at ANU, and he conducts research on internet interventions, suicide prevention and assessment of mental health. He's also a member of the Australian Rotary Health Research Committee, where he and nine other mental health experts go through applications and select the best candidates for research funding which includes mental health research grants and postdoctoral fellowships. So it's great to have you on our podcast today, Phil. Thanks very much for joining us. I'm yeah, sure thank like, you for inviting me. <laughs> no worries. I'm sure like many others, you've probably been doing a lot of work from home at the moment. So how's that been going for you? Uh, it's going okay. I mean, most of my research is conducted online anyway, so it's we've been able to continue most of our research studies. There have been some, some disruptions, but, but mostly going okay. Of course, I have to... Like many people, I have to juggle uh, family responsibilities with work, work duties. Mm. Uh, so there are occasionally some, some interruptions and hopefully we won't hear too many of those today. Um, but, but overall, it's, it's going okay. And I think uh, the other issue is, of course, reminding yourself to, to step away from the desk sometimes because it's easy to just keep working away when, you, when you're in, in the same home environment all day. So it's, it's good to take breaks and, and uh, make sure, sure I'm not overworking, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just finding that balance, I guess. It um, is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, can be challenging sometimes. Yeah, um, yeah so um, one of your research areas is in suicide prevention and recently in the news, um, I guess, yeah, it's been predicted by experts that suicide rates may go up as much as um, 50% which is, uh, it sounds pretty alarming, as a result of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So do you have any comments about this or, or possibly some advice for people who might be feeling suicidal at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think it's quite challenging to try and predict what the future suicide rates are likely to be. And I don't think it's particularly helpful necessarily to um, be discussing this in the media because we just don't know what sort of effect this pandemic will have. Um, it's kind of unprecedented in, in modern history in our lives. Uh, so it's really hard to say what effect it will have. We know that uh, things like financial distress and unemployment can have major impacts on mental health uh, and uh, particularly on vulnerable people. Um, so there are likely to be a number of, uh, of risks coming out of the COVID pandemic and the resulting uh, impacts on financial and social um, well-being of the community. Um, but we just don't know what these impacts are likely to be. Uh, so while it is useful to be prepared for kind of the future impacts of, of this crisis, uh, I think it's a little bit risky to try and predict this. And, and we know that certain uh, discussions in the media can be uh, potentially harmful for, for vulnerable people. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't like to go into too much detail about what the impacts, the future impacts might be. But it's, I think it's important to understand what's happening in the present moment. Um, and we are currently conducting a survey at ANU, a longitudinal study to look at how uh, mental health uh, outcomes are changing over the course uh, of the pandemic. Start, we started in, in late March and we're, we're following people uh, for a, a lengthy period of time to see what sort of outcomes it might be having on their mental health and wellbeing. So I think it's important to consider that, yes, it m- might have negative impacts for many people. For some people, it might also have positive impacts. We just don't really know. Um, so getting the really kind of high quality data to, to track what's happening in the community is important and being prepared for um, making sure the mental health system and the social uh, system in, in society is prepared for whatever negative uh, impacts there might be in the future. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And and for those people who, who might be feeling suicidal at the moment, um, is there anything that you can say to them, like to, to look after themselves? 
Uh, it, it's important to uh, seek help if you are feeling suicidal, and that can be from uh, informal sources, but we know that um, formal sources such as psychologists and GPs uh, and psychiatrists uh, can provide uh, evidence-based treatments that, that can help a lot of people in the community. So it's important to talk to people about how you're feeling. Uh, it's important to reach out and seek help if you are feeling suicidal. Uh, the first point of call can be your GP. Um, but I think more generally in the community, uh, making sure that you've got some sort of routine during the day, keeping a healthy lifestyle can be uh, helpful for many people. Maintaining social contacts, whether that be um, through video chat or other forms of communication, since we can't all you know, have face-to-face -face communications at this time. So it's important to keep up that, uh, those connections uh, and to keep yourself as healthy as possible and reach out if you are kind of feeling distressed or feeling suicidal. Mm, yeah, no, hopefully people, yeah, if anyone is feeling like that at the moment, hopefully they will have the courage to reach out. Yeah, it's a, it's a very yeah. hard time for a lot of people, I think. Um, yes, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, got going into to the grant that we awarded you, um, it was probably, probably about five years ago now and it was to test the effectiveness of an intervention to help young people with mental health problems. Um, can you tell us a bit about this intervention and the aims of the research project when you started out? Yeah, so it was a, um, the idea of the project was to test um, whether tailoring an intervention to uh, the, the symptoms that an individual is experiencing would have a greater benefit than providing a sort of a generic program. Um, so the idea of it was that we wanted to test uh, this uh, tailored program that uh, addresses the symptoms of a range of different mental disorders, so anxiety, uh, depression, uh, substance use disorders, as well as suicidality. Um, so the idea was we, we had three arms of, of, of the study. Uh, one group received a control intervention, a lifestyle-based intervention, uh, and the two other groups received uh, active intervention. So one received a sort of generic version of this, of this program uh, to address mental health symptoms. It was broadly kind of transdiagnostic. It addressed a range of different factors that are associated with a range of different mental health problems. Uh, the other group received this tailored program where they received specific modules that were targeted to the, the symptoms that they were experiencing. So we wanted to see whether um, this tailoring would have a positive effect both on um, mental health outcomes as well as uh, people's experience of, of the program. So whether they adhered to it, and con, um, completed more modules of the program, uh, and whether they were more satisfied with the program as well. Uh, so that was the aim of the study. Um, we were aiming to recruit about uh, 150 young people aged uh, 18 to 25. Uh, we didn't quite reach our targets. Uh, we, we, we got about 100 um, in, into the study. And uh, unfortunately, that wasn't a large enough sample to be able to find differences between the three arms uh, of the intervention, although we did find that uh, satisfaction uh, with the intervention was actually higher in the tailored treatment group, but we didn't find any differences between uh, mental health outcomes between the three conditions, uh, which meant that we had to kind of uh, then uh, plan for a larger study to, to test whether it was actually effective. So the findings were promising, but we, yeah, we didn't find large enough effects um, to, to suggest that it would be a, a, a viable treatment um, for, for people with mild to moderate symptoms of depression, anxiety, or substance use disorders. So, so even though it might not have gone exactly as planned, were, were you able to learn anything from the study or, or extend this research? Um, you said that you were planning for a larger study. Did, did that end up happening? Yeah, so, um, the, I mean, the findings suggested that... It, so there's a lot of uh, effort involved in trying to tailor an intervention to uh, specific patterns of mental health symptoms. So the findings of the study suggested it probably wasn't worth, I mean, the, the effects of doing that were probably quite minor. Uh, so it probably wasn't worth going to all those lengths um, to do that. Uh, it also suggested that perhaps the intervention was too complex trying to target substance use as well as mental health problems, a range of different mental health problems in the one uh, intervention was, was quite challenging. So uh, focusing uh, just on uh, depression and anxiety in, in future, future versions of the, of the program, uh, we thought might be the way to go. So uh, we got funding to, um, for an implementation uh, type trial where we were 
both testing the uh, efficacy, the, how effective the program was at reducing symptoms, so depression and anxiety symptoms in the community, as well as uh, identifying different pathways uh, that we might use to implement these, in, these types of interventions more widely into the community. So we were comparing um, online delivery of the intervention, so recruiting people through social media um, versus um, approaching people within GP clinics through an automated screener uh, and comparing that to approaching people in the community through an automated screener within uh, pharmacies, so um, in, with, with chemists. So um, that, that trial is still underway, so we're still doing that comparison between GPs and, and pharmacies, but we've completed uh, recruiting sufficient numbers uh, through social media. We've got over, got over 2,000 people um, signing up to the study um, to, uh, and then we're randomised to either receive a control intervention which is focused on lifestyle activities um, compared to our intervention which is called Fit Mind Kit which focuses broadly on a range of different uh, anxiety and depressive symptoms and, and is uh, somewhat transdiagnostic which again means that it's kind of focusing on common symptoms across those different um, types of disorders. Um, so I, I just looked at the data from that online sample yesterday and it looks quite promising that the intervention was likely to be effective um, because we have that larger sample size. We're able to show that, that difference there. And, and looking into the long term, uh, thinking about ways that we might kind of implement these types of programs into the community more broadly so that we can reach those people who might benefit from these types of interventions. Mm, yeah, well, it sounds like it's a, it's a very important study and it's good that so far you've got, you know, those numbers to, to show a significant difference. So, yeah, that, that sounds like it would be a good thing. Do you, do you know when that will um, wrap up? Uh, so the, the larger trial wraps up uh, the end of this year, so we'll have the data complete at that stage. So it's actually a, a, um, a collaboration with a, a, running, a range of partners from EU countries. So there's... Uh, 12 different partners from uh, across Europe and, and two partners in Australia. So the combined data from uh, these different sites will uh, give us some information about uh, how sort of implementation can be best done within, particularly within clinical settings, um, such as GP clinics, um, psychological clinics, and we're also looking at the pharmacy setting as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that works across a range of different countries in, and in different settings. Uh, which will give us a lot of, I think, really rich information about how best to reach those in the community who might benefit from these sorts of programs. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds really good. I hope, I hope it goes well. Um, yeah, thank as, you. As I um, mentioned before, another role of yours is uh, um, being a member of our research committee. Um, we see so many applications being sent through and it's quite a competitive process for researchers to, to be awarded a grant. Um, would you like to talk about the process of going through these grant applications um, to maybe give our Rotarians and donors some peace of mind that their donations are really going to the best of the best? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it is a very rigorous process. Um, we get a large number of applications. I think uh, typically we get uh, over 400 applications. So, so there's a, a two-stage process. We get uh, expressions of interest which are kind of short applications and then from those we choose uh, only about 10% to go through to submit a full application. Um, so uh, there's a very rigorous process where we meet as a panel, uh, everybody rates the applications and then we discuss the, the merits of each application um, as a panel. Um, so it's a very lengthy process so from the 400 applications typically there's uh, only funding for a sort of uh, eight, eight to 15 sort of applications, um, which, is, which is fabulous and it's had a massive impact on mental health research in Australia. Uh, but it's a really difficult decision um, to find the most uh, worthwhile applications that are gonna have the greatest impact on the community. So we have a really uh, robust discussion. We bring in scores from a range of different experts, uh, primarily researchers, but also clinicians and people with lived experience. Uh, and so it's this uh, lengthy process from that we decide based on a range of different criteria, uh, most importantly on the, on the scientific merit of the application and on the impact that it's going to have on the community. Uh, we decide on, on what, the, what the best applications are uh, and then whatever our funding Rotary has to, uh, to fund those um, programs of research, uh, they, those programs go, go ahead and, and, and get funding. So it's 
it's a highly competitive uh, process and it's a highly robust process that we go through. Um, and I think it's, it's, I mean, it's always disappointing that, that we can't fund more and, and we always want to fund as many projects as we can. There's many uh, really exciting and interesting projects, uh, but we've got to be as rigorous as possible and make, and make tough decisions. And we do that uh, as, 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 well as, as well, well as we can. Yeah, it's it's definitely a very tough process, you know, trying to narrow it down to, to 15, you know, out of 400. It's just, um, yeah, it's a lot to go through. And, yes, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I guess, you know, at the, at the moment, many of the events that Rotarians would usually hold across the year have been cancelled or postponed due to this coronavirus. We've already discussed that our mental health and, and you know, it's it's hard to predict, you know, rates of suicide and, and how the impact will be after this pandemic. But, you know, it, it looks so far like there is an impact. Um, do you have a, a message of encouragement for people to consider donating to mental health research at, at this moment while this is all happening? Yes, well, um, mental health research in Australia doesn't receive a large proportion of funding. So, uh, from uh, government sources such as NHMRC, we typically get about eight to nine percent of the funding, whereas the impact of mental health on the community uh, in terms of the total disease burden is about uh, 15 to 17 percent of the total disease burden. Um, so we're getting about half of what you'd expect, um, whereas other research areas such as uh, cancer or cardiovascular disease get a much more proportionate um, piece of the pie. Um, we also don't have many philanthropic organisations that um, donate to mental health research specifically. So uh, Australian Rotary Health is really valuable from, from that regard. Um, and the other thing we know is that Australian mental health research is, is really impactful uh, across a range of different measures of, of, of impact in terms of the number of uh, outputs or publications that we produce and the quality of those publications. Australia ranks around fourth or fifth in the world in terms of uh, mental health research. Uh, compared to other areas of medical research, they typically rank around 10th to 12th. So uh, we don't receive a lot of funding. We do really impactful research. Uh, and importantly, that's having a really uh, big impact on the community, the way that we uh, both assess, treat and prevent mental health problems in the community has improved over the past 20, 30 years. And that's because we're doing the research that, that lets us know what the most appropriate ways are to assess and to prevent and treat uh, mental health problems in the community uh, in the way that's going to benefit um, people when they need it most. So I think uh, donating to Australian Rotary Health is going to have a uh, huge potential for having a direct impact on the mental health of young Australians in particular. And we know that the, uh, the burden of mental health problems falls disproportionately on young people um, compared to other diseases where it's uh, pre predominantly in, in mid midlife and late life. Um, mental health has a huge impact on young people. So I think the focus that Australian Rotary Health has on the mental health of young people is really important to Australia. Mm, yeah, definitely. Well, it's been really great to um, have you on our fourth episode of our podcast today, Phil. Was there anything else that you wanted to add before we wrap up today? Uh, not really, just to thank you again for uh, having me on the podcast and, and I appreciate all the work that Australia Rotary Health is doing and, and just the huge impact it is having on, uh, on mental health research in Australia. There have been so many projects and so many postdocs funded over the years and PhD scholars and that makes a real difference. Uh, we really need to build capacity in, in mental health research in Australia so we can continue to make that difference. And so I greatly appreciate the work that Australian Rotary Health is doing in, in, progressing, in progressing that. Well, yeah, thank you very much for your work on the research committee as well. It's such an important role. And, yeah, thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the fourth episode of our podcast called The Research Behind Lift the Lid. It's always so inspiring to hear what researchers in Australia are doing to make a difference to mental health and how they are helping us on our mission to lift the lid on mental illness. If you would like to help more mental health research like Dr. Batterham's continue, please continue consider donating to our COVID-19 appeal. We have an aim to raise $200,000 by June 30, so your support would be very much appreciated please see the link to donate on our Australian Rotary Health Facebook page. We hope you will join us again next time. Thank you very much for listening.